Share Shootout brought to you by Lion of Africa Insurance, insuring South Africa's future. You're watching the most vicious, backbiting, sly, cunning, stock-picking show so far on television. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and over the next 30 minutes, I'll be your host, judge, juror, and executioner. Now, was it real love between Rampili and Zilla, or was it just a five-day stand? Is Mumbai the future HQ for Microsoft, That now that Satya Nadella is the new chief executive of the world's biggest software provider? And did the presidency receive a sand rail bill before querying the bidding system for the rest of us? Now, we don't know the answers to any of these perplexing questions. We never do. All we do know is we've got a man who's had a backup career as a math teacher before his broken career got going. And then, of course, there's another who likes cycling along Durban's beachfront if somebody else is doing the pedaling. Will Gary reign supreme or has he found his match introducing a challenger with just three appearances, one win and two losses? Love in the Bryanson Bulldog Gopal from uh, Trade Barn. He takes on with an almighty 12 appearances, 9 wins and 3 losses. Gary Sher, shootout record holder, for now at least, Boyson from Vunani Private Club. There is one rule to live by. Never, never, under any circumstances, put your vodka glass next to your water glass at night. But on Share Shootout, we have just a few rules. Our guests have pre-picked three shares. Neither knows what the other holds, but each must accept at least one of their competitors' picks. The longer they leave it, the more likely they are to have to accept something they really don't like. Each has got just 30 seconds to argue their stock pick, so let's let the Share Shootout begin. With that tie, Levan Gold, Paul, you've got to go first, because if this was about ties, I would come last, Gary would come second, and you most certainly would win. I hope it's a sign of things to come. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, certainly you win on the tie front. Let us go into your first pick, and I find it fascinating because it's not a market darling, it's not a market favorite. It has got some nice offshore exposure in Switzerland. It has nothing to do with the chocolate industry other than perhaps mopping up some of its excesses. In 30 seconds, please tell me why you like MediClinic. Okay. MediClinic's got a fair deal of international exposure. It's got exposure to the Middle East as well as Europe. Uh, they've recently uh, put on board some good financing, so that helps them weather the storm. It's also assisted with some of their expansion activity. Uh, they've got very good uh, tutelage uh, from uh, their stewards, Remgro. Uh, it is almost a bulletproof industry, fairly defensive in the healthcare sector, and uh, it's under review at the moment by the South African authorities. Your 30 Private seconds healthcare. are up. Okay, there we go, Medicanic, he likes it. The question is, not whether I like it, not whether anybody watching at home likes it, because really, the most brutal critic in the history of this show is next to you. He's as vicious and as mean as he is tall. His name is Gary. <laughs> I'm champion for now, Boyson. So, Gary, Mediclinic, is there a lot not to like? Um, it's not a lot not to like. I'm going to shoot it down. Um, I, I mean, it, you know, at, the, at current valuations, it looks okay. But uh, you know, you, you mentioned just at the end of your pitch the the, the regulatory environment. I yep. mean, obviously, you, you know, in South Africa, especially. I mean, granted, you know, Switzerland, they're doing interesting things. Dubai, I know they've they've got some great hospital uh, clinics up and running in Dubai as well. But in South Africa specifically, I mean, the the regulations. I mean, they, they've, they, the commission has gone to I think it was six of January. They started. We're going to get uh, results out soon. It looks like the government's got the the private healthcare sector especially in their, in their targets. And, and I think that if, if, if regulation does change, that uncertainty, you could get a significant re To be fair, that regulation has been looming for the last five years. But the issue of national health care, the first draft papers that came out of the ANC saying basically, let's lower the standard of private health care to improve, the st to raise the standard, or at least make public health care look less awful than it is. Um, that sort of stuff's been around for a long time. We've seen a massive re-rating in the health uh, sector. We've seen the shares recover really nicely. Isn't it all already priced in? What I believe is that uh, for the South African public to be better off, we're going to have to raise the standard of everything. So public health care, I believe, will be seriously looked at and uh, will be at a higher level because uh, for, for a variety of reasons. If you make reasons, me look bad, I've got two choices. I either up my game or I slap you down. And, and so isn't that the risk that Gary's pointing to? Well, I think they're going to have to lift their game not only in private but also in public health care. As private health care becomes uh, more uh, service orientated uh, for a number of people, they'll be locked in as we are locked into private schools, uh, private Good security. Point. We, we have forced. We, if to you go have, to private if, if you have money to spare, you once you get your kids. Well, once you've secured your home with a private security company, you've got money to spare. You then educate your kids. Um, once you've educated them with some money to spare, you look after healthcare. It's one of those things which affluent people in society like South Africa cannot go without. And a big beneficiary of that is medical. No, there's no question. 
question, but I mean, we're talking like we're specifically talking about regulations uh, as to what um, uh, MediClinic can and can't do. The problem is, I 100% agree with you. I think the right thing is to improve private healthcare and improve public healthcare, make the whole pie bigger. Everyone gets better. I mean, the fact is, what's going to happen is probably not that. Look at look at the platinum sector. I mean, we had Nick Holland come out the other day saying the mining sector in South Africa, we're arguing over a smaller size, uh, like a bigger slice of a smaller pie. Let's try and expand the pie. What do, what do the regulatory authorities yeah. do? They make okay. the pie even smaller. For me, just because it's, it's what should happen is not what's going to happen. With government getting involved, I would stay I, I, I was talking recently to Ketso Gordon, who's worked in the public sector and then the private sector, and then back in the public sector, and I was back in the private sector as chief executive of PPC, and he talks about the frustration of dealing within government circles. Government doesn't move very fast. So, Levin, I'm afraid you have been shot down on uh, MediClinic, but not because of MediClinic, but because of the environment in which it operates. Okay. Uh, operates. That's a hospital joke. I like it. <laughs> um, Gary Boyson from Bonani Private Clients. I like your first pick. I find it fascinating in an environment where these guys are facing margin compression. Vodacom just last week came out with a trading update um, in which it showed that, that there was huge mar margin compression. I'm interested as to think as to why you could possibly choose Vodacom trading on a multiple of 13 times. Nice dividend yield, yeah. Maybe that's the point in 30 seconds. Yeah, the, um, dividend yield's one of them. I mean, it's, again, it's a defensive company. It's almost, I mean, you have to look at a telco's into your utility these days. I mean, Vodacom, you know, it, it's, it's wrapped up South Africa, it's got uh, you know, an amazing presence, best best network and service quality. I mean, if you look at the, uh, my broadband and uh, um, the Acasa latest survey, I mean, they're beating hands down MTN and Celsi in, in service quality. You're seeing the service revenue now in those results. It's, it's three quarters now of, uh, of positive service revenue growth, which is fantastic. I mean, in a, in a difficult environment, they, they're really pulling down. 30 seconds are up. Argue against that. I dare you. I won't. No, uh, he, soft touch. He, 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 rang, he rang on Vodacom and I picked up that call. Okay. So I did long on <laughs> Vodacom. I think it's a good stock. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, very uncertain about the direction of the market overall. Uh, but if I had to stock pick, Vodacom is one that I'd go long of. I think there's huge growth in Africa that they can still play the patchwork against uh, MTN on. Uh, they've also got a lot of uh, upside potential. Now, S uh, recently, there's been some changes in terms of the call rates. Interconnect um, rates. Now, interconnect fees have been butchered down to virtually nothing, which is great if you're Telcom. Um, it's great if you're MTN because you're, you're, you're smaller in South Africa yeah. than Vodacom. Vodacom is the big dog in this market. It is the biggest loser from interconnect. So, yes, they're going to lose points on that score. They're, they're probably going to pick up points along the way as they sell more data, as they sell more uh, uh, of their mobile uh, phones and packages. So I think overall, dominant player in South Africa, potential to dominate in Africa. Now, on that point, I have to agree with you because we've seen the appointment of a new chief executive at Microsoft, of course, yeah. uh, Satya... Mm, I want to say Nadal, but he's a tennis player. <laughs> but that guy, the new guy, um, the third chief executive in the history of, of Microsoft, will get used to his name. Um, here, here is a guy who's talking about the future of Microsoft going mobile. Everybody is talking about the future being mobile. The PC, as we know it, is potentially prehistoric. Now, under those circumstances, the telcos have got to benefit, Gary. No, definitely. And you're seeing, again, you're seeing that in Vodacom's numbers. I mean, Levant's already alluded to the fact that you've seen a lot of, uh, you know, revenue shift into the data. And that's, that's a trend that's just continuing. It's been going what on for a while. What about the price, though, but, but of the, actual the servicing? The price of the servicing, okay, we'll get to that in a second, but I mean, smartphones um, uh, as well, like massive increase in smartphones, in Africa especially, I mean, I think it was up 84%, I mean, almost doubling the usage of smartphones, uh, you know, that are through Vodacom services. So, I mean, definitely a trend that, that is very apparent and, and that the market is going in. And if I they mean, get the $100 smartphone right to all the $50 smartphone is empty. Then you're away, and, and, it's not, and it's not just, you know, using Microsoft or, you know, your normal web browsing. I mean, look at the Impeza in, in Tanzania as well. Massive gains there uh, for Vodacom mm -hmm. again. So I think overall a very quality company. You obviously mentioned the interconnect fees. The one thing I, I did allude to, you know, improved uh, network quality. That's the one thing that is going to put a lid on it. I mean, we did see uh, the MTR revenue coming down in those results. But um, you, if you look at, again, the network quality, Celsi, Telcom, they don't quite, maybe Telcom to an extent with a fixed line, but I mean, t uh, like Celsi, they don't have the, the infrastructure to just mm. go and grab market share. They can't do it. It's not physically possible, okay. even with the advantage. So for now, I think Vodacom's entrenched and it's going gonna, it's gonna to use it. You're preaching to the converted. <laughs> okay. but but it's a good and <laughs> compelling yeah. argument. I agree 100%. Yes. I know that they're also spending a huge amount of capex in technology advancements. And, and that's the downside of this business is the amount of money they need yeah. to spend to 
at least keep ahead. Sure. And that's what, six, seven billion rand a year. Mm. What about the possibility for take out of Vodafone? Because suddenly, um, the speculation <laughs> is that AT&T in the United States is looking to take out Vodafone, which would then make Vodacom American. It's well, amazing how quickly look, things can change, market, should it happen. As the market contracts, it's only going to be uh, a situation that's better off for shareholders and users. So a lot more shared yes. technology, probably another reason to buy the, uh, the okay. stock. So Vodacom, you like it, you're taking Correct. it. Mm. Vodacom gets uh, the thumbs up, Gary Boyson. I, I'm captivated by this, Levin Gopal, because you clearly aren't feeling very well. Why two hospital yeah. shares? Out of three, 66.66% 66 .66 of your picks this evening are hospital passes. So, in 30 seconds, <laughs> you gave us MediClinic, but you couldn't really make up your mind, so you thought, let me hedge myself with life healthcare. In 30 seconds, why? Well, firstly, I was forced to go long only in this show, so I'm actually short in the market or playing pairs. Life healthcare has recently been put into the top 40, so a number of tracker funds are going to be gobbling up stock. It's going to be in good demand. It's made uh, an impression in Asia uh, as uh, more of its business has shifted focus uh, into the Asian region, so you're getting some uh, technology sharing as well as some international revenue. Uh, for what it's worth, they've got a fairly good map of South Africa, and of course, for the above reason of being a defensive yeah, okay, stock. Okay, we bought them. Okay, <laughs> we're <laughs> you're repeating yourself. And Gary Boyson, without going through the whole process of talking about the regulatory regime and why you didn't like uh, MediClinic, you're yes. shooting this one down. Shooting it down. Okay, yeah. let's move on then. D ditto, yeah. Okay, same ditto. as what I said, and uh, also just on the tracker funds, though, I'd also say that's yeah. been priced in already. Okay. I mean, you know, it's already in the top 40. Like, I mean, the, the trade has already been done. I mean, you've seen the movements in the price for that. So I think that maybe is already discounted. It's the only other point on my phone. Okay, so if you if you just tuned into the show, because I know you PVR it, just at the end of the show, go back to Levin's first pick, which was MediClinic, and then replay Gary's responses to why he didn't like MediClinic, and then juxtapose that into Life Healthcare, and then you've got the answers to why he's shooting it down. Let's move on. On to your second pick this evening, Gary. I told you it was vicious, I told you it was brutal, and I told you we don't take prisoners Swimming on, with on the, the show. <laughs> Swimming with the sharks, it's lovely, isn't it? But you still went mm -hmm. on ties. Gary Boyson, in 30 seconds, this is interesting because the share price in the last couple of weeks, since interest rates went up, mm. imperial share prices plummeted. Mm. You know what they say about bottom pickers? <laughs> Smelly fingers. Exactly. Huh? 30 <laughs> seconds, tell me why. Um, yeah, and, and that is pretty much where I'm going. <laughs> so, I mean, the rewrite rating has been I I incredible on, on Imperial. I mean, uh, you're down almost 25% uh, on the counter so far. But, uh, you know, if you actually look at their businesses, they are streamlined. They are more efficient than they've ever been. Yes, you know, you are going to get some sort of uh, contraction rate tight, uh, you know, weak RAND. That all impacts negatively on the company. But it it's, it's, is priced in now. If you look at their, their EPS, you're looking at uh, it's around 18 RAND. By 2015, we're looking sort of 20, 23 rand even. So, I mean, it's well, at least 2021. So, there we go. I mean, time we're, is we're up. Looking at time fundamental is up. Time good. is up. It's, it's a cheap. company that it's is well listed, is leaderless. Its chief executive, Hubert Brody, announced last year yeah. that he was quitting. They haven't yet announced a replacement. Hubert Brody is the guy who's pulled it all together, who's taken the great giant that Bill Lynch built and made it manageable. And he's really squeezed the best out of Imperial. The market's telling us that. Gary, however, thinks it's a different story. Do you like him, Barry? If it was cheap today, it'll be cheaper in six <laughs> months' time. Uh, I'm not uh, going to go with this. I'm going to shoot it down. I won't go short on the stock, but I'd rather avoid. Uh, I believe that the market's heading for a bit of a downspell through 2014, a reminder of 1998, and a number of emerging markets are going to be out of vogue. We've also got rising interest rates. All of this creates a negative complex for Imperial. It's not a stock that you can have in your portfolio or trade long on. Uh, uh, of course, the business that it's in is interest rate sensitive, but also negative on the RAND, and I don't believe it's cheap at this stage. I want to talk about Imperial specifics in just a moment, and later on I want to talk about why you're so bearish on the overall sure. market in an environment where many other people are saying we could still get a 10% return from the elevated levels that we started uh, at the beginning of this year. So hold that thought. Imperial, negative on the currency because they import lots of stock, um, and if the RAND suddenly goes against them on that, they've got a big problem Under there. Plus, of course, um, uh, the, the, the issue of South African consumers being cash shipped. They simply aren't going to be buying as many new cars as they might have two years ago. No, definitely. And obviously with the retailers coming down, you're going to have uh, you know, a little, their logistics business also under pressure. The point is that we're looking at valuations of the company. Uh, what, you, got, you got the PE there. It must be what, the, nine? The PE of Imperial is around nine. nine. It's cheap. I mean, that is cheap. That is cheap. So, I mean, we're looking at the valuation of the company. Cheaper. Remember, yes, it does. It is rent. It, it can get cheaper, but it is rent sensitive. But they also have uh, you know, like a good exposure to you know, the 
German market. They are still they still have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They are looking for acquisitions overseas as well. They are now moving into Brazil as well. I mean, they've got they do have revenue that comes from offshore, which is obviously you know offset. What about leadership? Local. Leadership. Um, I mean, it's a well-run company, and it's got depth from from our point of view. I mean, it's got depth. I mean, like you, you mentioned, obviously, you know, Hubert Broad stepping down, but I mean, it's got depth of leadership at the top. I mean, the guys that are that are sit on that that board have been there a long time, and they know what they're doing. So mm -hmm. they've they've seen these sorts of uh, you know uh, downturns, and it is it is a cyclical company. They've seen these downturns before. They've handled them well in the past. I believe they'll handle them. I well think it'll again. be technically cheap, eighteen percent lower. So maybe you could <laughs> set your portfolio <laughs> purchase, put your buy orders in. Uh, about 18 okay. percent. Are, you, are you really that negative on a bear? I, I don't believe that it's it's trading on a nine, B, nine PE because it's forward PE doesn't look very healthy. Forward earnings on this counter is probably forward forward PE is sitting at about eight, say seven and a half eight. Yeah. So, so it's not that bad. <laughs> for me, it's not a promising sector. Okay. And uh, there's other sectors that I'd look at something more defensive if you have mm. to go along. Okay, but not right. Well, okay. Let's move on from a <laughs> You're shooting in peril. I'm interested in why you become. Part up there. Well, if I look at the interest rate scenario, uh, the 12 year versus the two year, so if you look at the, f the, the spread narrowing by what, 2.6%, it tells you that on an interest rate basis, this market is factoring in at least 25 to 3% interest rate increase in South Africa uh, over the next six months. And traditionally, interest rate increases are terrible for equity markets. Very bad for equity markets, very bad for uh, finance companies, uh, property companies, banks, uh, motor vehicle industry. So I'd rather go for defensive pl uh, plays. So maybe tobacco, maybe alcohol, drugs. So of course, healthcare is it. Okay, but that's why he's gone twice. He keeps beating <laughs> the same drum. Um, but Gary, are, are you as negative? I mean, here we saw a, a market that went in the first month of this year through 47,000 and there was absolutely nothing holding mm. it back until Ben Bernanke just went and Janet Yellen indicated that she will tighten just that little bit further as the year progresses. Plus, we've seen this emerging markets uh, crisis with the Turks raising interest rates by 425 basis points. That's forced our hand. Jill Marcus, although she's not saying she will, she must raise interest rates further this year. Whether it's going to be 300 basis points, I do not know in six months. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a very bearish view. Are you as bearish on the overall market as Levenis? Um, I think I was in the beginning. But I mean, we've, we've now looked through the numbers. I mean, you know, our, our economists have come out and they, they we're looking at, yes, right, rate tightening has started, but we're probably looking at another 100 basis points for the year. Not, not as dramatic. And then at least a stabilization, if not a further cut, just because growth is going to be under so much pressure. And, and personally, I don't see, you know, with growth under pressure, I don't see where the inflation is going to come from. Uh, that's going to force the Reserve Bank to continue a, a tightening cycle. On Yellen, I think she's going to think she's going to delay the tapering. I mean, if these markets crash significantly, which they are busy doing, I mean, mm -hmm. three trillion wiped off global equity markets so far. What's she going to do? She's just she's not going to make that she, turn. She, and these she, markets she, are going back to all-time yeah, highs. Yeah, but that's the risk be that you careful, face. Be being careful. Be careful. Very, this market. very, we very. We have to pause at this point. He <laughs> wants to keep fighting. It's the advocate <laughs> in him. He's a lawyer by training, and that's where he comes from. And that's why he's always up for a bulldog fight. Uh, the winner of the battle has got is, is really going to be decided in the next round. What we've got so far from Gary Boyson at for 95 clients is Vodacom and Imperial. Uh, Levin likes uh, Vodacom. Uh, thinks Imperial could go a hell of a lot cheaper before he would even go anywhere near it. Levin. Uh, hospital pass on two points, MediClinic and Life Healthcare. We didn't even bother listening to his Life Healthcare pick because the response was going to be the same, which puts Gary Boyson in a really interesting position because he has to pick the lemon in the number three spot. We'll come back to that one in just a moment. Take no prisoners, you're watching the most vicious stock picking show on your tube. This is Share Shootout right here on CNBC Africa, first in business worldwide. Before the break, Gary and Levin both gave us two of their stock picks. Uh, from Levin Go Paul, we saw MediClinic and Life Healthcare both shot down by Gary Boyson. The Vodacom pick was accepted and Imperial shot down. It may surprise you, Levin Go Paul, to know. Gary Boyson's third pick this evening is Netcare. In third, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do tell me why. Again, you, you, you're liking the underdogs right now. You're liking the shares that have been bashed and battered and bruised from the inter recent interest rate increase. 
and therefore I'm interested in why you like True Earths in 30 seconds. I don't know, just to clear, I don't like True Earths, I've got a short on True you got a short on True Earths. I have a short on True Earths, yeah, specifically because it's a credit retailer, it's the one with the, the biggest exposure to credit, so we're short, definitely shorting it on the back of that. One, uh, you guys have already mentioned the, the international situation, money pulling out of emerging markets, incredible uh, you know, foreign holding in the stock, which has only come down, I think, about 9%, still I think around 60% foreign held, that's got a long way further to come down, and yeah, the retailers is generally under a of pressure with a rate hike so all, <laughs> all your guys arguments that's why we're shorting shorting through it there we go. he used his 30 seconds absolutely beautifully i saw you grimace when he said he was going to short it well I think because you have to support the short <laughs> don't you <laughs> it's 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 the time to be bearish and certainly retailers again there's a song in there somewhere uh, <laughs> it's fallen a lot. Yeah. This, this counter has been under a lot of pressure. Yep. Amongst the retailers that you've got to start uh, cherry picking if you want to be long on, uh, so Woolworths and Truett start to come up as interesting plays, so does Mr. Price. Overall, the sector has been uh, hammered. And the last uh, few days with interest rate talk, uh, as well as the market following uh, all of the other EM lower, uh, I think this one's been hurt very badly. So if you're looking for Has a short spike. Has it been hurt spike, badly enough, though? Uh, over time, uh, you you're not Because you're not going for Imperial. You've got to keep consistent yeah. here, you see. Imperial, you don't like because it'll fall another 18% to sure. your view. True Earths, on the same basis, has got to come down further. So over time, I think you're going to see maybe a bit of a dip. In the near term, I think there's still a spike. Uh, watch out oh, for you're that desperate. dead cat <laughs> bounce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're accepting it, or you're, you're accepting the short? No, I'll, or go, you're long. I'll go long in the you're short You're going term. long in the short on term. True Earths. You're shooting down the short. Yeah. There we go. I'll take He's that order. Right. <laughs> you you phone me afterwards. We'll put real money on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. You guys can sort it out in your own time. Um, so your short is shot down on True Worths. Um, mm. An interesting, an interesting choice there. Right. Let's move on to the final pick for the evening. And this is one that Gary Boyson, by default, has to accept, and he's got to find good reasons to accept it. I'm surprised by the price movement in this share, but it has had a long five-year bruising battle with its biggest supplier of iron ore. That battle seems to have been finally resolved. The chief executive who oversaw that battle has moved on. There's an acting sure. chief executive in place at ArcelorMittal. I am fascinated in a gloomy environment as to why you think ArcelorMittal, after a nice long rally, is still a buy, Levengo. The stock of steel. Um, I think that it is a steal at these prices. Uh, for, for now, you've seen production dip quite sharply because of a fire uh, in Thunderbell Park. And there's probably a nice insurance payout on its way. You probably see it in the calendar year 2014. But the reason that they've been lower is not because of uh, bad management uh, or earnings problems. It was a capacity issue, and they weren't able to output. Now that uh, their production's normalized somewhat, I think uh, this year you're going to see fairly decent production. And yes, steel demand globally <laughs> will be slightly Can lower. Can I just challenge you on the management issue? Yeah. Didn't somebody forget to sign some important sort of upgrade of mining licenses or something five years ago, which has led to their particularly dismal performance for five years in a row? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also a combination of some bad luck. Fire uh, problems that we've seen in Thunderbell Park have hurt them quite sharply. And uh, remember, this comes as a legacy from the old ISCO. You sound, like, a, you sound like counsel for the defence, my advocate. <laughs> um, okay, no, and, and legacy and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Gary, you have to like it, but you mm. cannot like it. I saw you nodding vigorously as soon as you mentioned a big fat insurance payment. I'm you cannot like it just because yeah, of that. I was, I was scraping the bottom of the barrel for things, but I'll accept it because yeah, well, it's, it is Africa's largest deal. I mean, it's and again, it's a cyclical industry. If we see commodity prices and steel prices ticking up, it will do well. I don't think it's particularly badly managed. But, but what about steel demand? In an economy... I feel. I have to accept <laughs> <laughs> In an economy that's yes. growing at 2 2.5%, I've got to challenge your picking it. I would, I would love, yeah, I'd love to shoot it down, but I can't. So I'll accept it on the basis that perhaps, <laughs> even though you know my fundamental view is that steel demand is not going to pick up. So just to labor the point, but, but it's let's, trading let's, at half book. Let's at the moment, it's trading at half book. But who determines the book? Oh, the market. <laughs> the, um, the, the market doesn't determine the book. The accountants determine <laughs> the book. Let's let's pretend the commodity prices are going to recover, and we saw it today. Record exports yep. out of uh, out of China. I mean, out of uh, Australia into China for coal. So perhaps not so bad in China. Perhaps a re-rating up in the. Even country. if demand were desperate, desperate, desperate. <laughs> desperate. <laughs> Last even point. If, Last even point. if demand were to remain flat, just as uh, investors start realizing that on uh, forward book value this looks cheap, they start gobbling up the stock you probably have got another 20 or 25% ahead of you. It's probably the cheapest uh, stock in a market that I still believe is bad. Okay, there we go. No, I'm going Paul. Right, now, we, we, so you, you've accepted it. You know, uh, w w what we do know is that he is 
morally flexible. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I will say. Now, I'm going to determine who the weakest link is. Levin Gopal from Trademark gave us MediClinic Life, Healthcare and Arsenal Mittal. Uh, Gary Boyson gave us Photocom, which was accepted, Imperial, which was shot down, and he gave us a short on Trueworths, which was shot down as well. I've got to decide who stays and who goes. Who is the weakest link? And based purely on the fact that he couldn't have been bothered to look beyond more than two sectors, I'm afraid Levin Gopal. You gotta go wider. And going wider is a personal philosophy I like to follow myself. This is uh, the end of Share Shootout. Uh, next week, Gary Boyson will take on the formidable baby faced assassin Mike Hallworth from Applied Capital Insights. We haven't had him on the show for a long time. He went off into the ether. He's licked his wounds. He has re strategized and replanned. And so, Gary Boyson will be coming back for game number 14, victory number 11 or something. I think next week he may very well meet his matches. They're battled out in the most brutal stock picking show yet on television. We'll be back here uh, next week on Tuesday, right here on CNBC Africa. Until then, we will continue to pick out winners and shoot out the rest. Do treat your compliments to at Bruce Business and keep your negative opinions to yourself. Good night.